Hello and welcome back to Climate Unbox. Now if you search on YouTube you'll find a great Michael McIntyre video sketch about hotel buffets. You might only have an egg for your breakfast normally but faced with a hotel buffet it's just too tempting to take the sausage, the fruit, the bowls of cereal and everything under the sun. Now we'll find that human nature operates the same way when it comes to getting ERA 5 reanalysis and other data. We tend to get a little bit greedy and I've been practicing my manic evil laugh all week. Greed for data. So what I'm going to do today is I want to show you how this is where the strength of the API really lies and how we can write simple loops in Python to automate downloads. Now anybody who's an expert already in Python will probably want to skip onto my next video. This is really aimed at people with limited background or no background in Python at all. Now behind me you'll see the browser for the ERA5 hourly data and in this case on single levels. We saw this in the first video of ERA5 downloads. A typical workflow might be the following. We might decide at first we're logging on to have a look at downloading uh, a variable such as temperature. So we click on temperature, but then we say, well, actually, while I'm here, why don't I get the dew point temperature? And, and then maybe also total precipitation as well. Um, we're here, why not? And we scroll up to the next section and we say, well, we need data for you know a couple of years, five years, 10 years. Well, while we're here, let's just take all the years and all the months in the year and all the days in the month. And well, we want to calculate the diurnal cycle. And if we want to do daily averages, we, we need all the hours in the day as well. So now after making those selections, we scroll down, we select net CDF as the format, and we're all ready to press the download button. And so we scroll up and, oh, we have an error. We can see that the request, it says, is too large. We're trying to get over a million fields and the limit is currently set to 120,000. So what do we do? Well, we need to reduce your selection, it says. So we'll scroll back up. Now we could do this in a number of ways. We're roughly 10 times over the limit. so it would be enough to simply select one time or one day or one month. And I'm going to show an example where I'm going to select just one year. So I'm going to click on clear all and I'll click on 2020 to select only the data for 2020. Now, when we scroll back to the bottom, all the buttons are green, fantastic. So if we wanted to get the 2020 data, we would just click on submit form and it would launch the retrieval. Well, that's fine, but then well, we don't just want 2020, do we? We want 2019 and 2018 and 2017. So we'll have to scroll back up, change the selection to 2019, unselect 2020, scroll back down, press the green button, download the data. It gets tedious very, very quickly. So this is where the strength of the API lies. I'm going to click on the API button just to show this example. And this gives us this little piece of code that I introduced in my earlier ERA 5 video. So I simply want to highlight this code like this. I'm going to press Control C and I'm going to minimize the window and I'm going to go now to my uh, desktop. And I'm going to edit a text file using Emacs in this case. Remember, you can use any text editor of your choice and I'm going to call it get um, data dot pi. No, let's call it get era five dot pi. Okay. And then I launch an editing window. So if I switch to this window now, here we have it. So we have a blank editing window and I want to paste that code into that window. So, so this is the code that we had from the website of the CDS. Now I could just save this and run it just like I showed you in my earlier video. But the point is at the moment it only downloads the data in this case for 2019. That was my last selection. 
So what we need to do is we need to make three modifications in order to set up a loop over all of the years. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up a loop over years. So it's now time for the Climate Unbox short guide to loops in Python. So, oh, hi there. So, um, most codes have a structure for loops which are rather like the following. You have an indicator for the start of the loop saying how many times you want to repeat the code, then you have a bunch of codes that you want to loop over, and then you need some kind of statement that says here is the end of the loop. For example, in Fortran you could write a simple loop like this, where i is a variable, it's looped over the numbers 1 to 5, and then we simply have a statement print hello world, which is repeated five times, and then we have an end do statement that says this is the end of the loop. Now if you look at both of these uh, examples, you can see that there is one thing that's perhaps not that nice, and that is that it's quite difficult to see where the loop starts and where the loop finishes. And so for a long time it's been programming etiquette to actually move the code inside the loop to the right. So you actually write justify at a tab statement or a couple of spaces so that you can clearly see the start and the end of the loop. So the problem with this is that human nature, of course, is to be a little bit lazy. So you usually find that often people forget to indent or they only indent part of the loop, that code moves raggedly from right to left, and it's a bit of a mess. And so Python does something quite clever. It actually gets rid of that last statement, the end of the loop, and forces you to indent. The indentation actually specifies what code is inside the loop. Now the standard, you can actually move any number of spaces to the right, it's your choice. Here we have two, but in fact uh, the standard is to have four spaces as an indentation, so most editors build that in. And of course then we have an example here where we can then have sub-nested loops, so then if you just simply have a colon and then more code justified further to the right, then that last line there would actually be in a nested loop and repeated in within both of those loop structures. So loops in Python are done in the following way. We can say for year in, and we want a list of years. And we can do this very simply using the range function. So range, we simply give two arguments for the start and the end year. So I'll type 1979 to 2021. Now note, an idiosyncrasy of Python range function is it gives you a list of integers. So it gives a stride of one, 1979, 1980, but it doesn't include the last number. So this will give me a list of years from 79 up to 2020. If you want 2021, you'll need to end it with 22. Now we need a colon and I press the enter. Now, if you notice, something strange happened. When I pressed the enter key, the cursor didn't return to the beginning of the line. It returned to a position indented by four spaces. So the indentation actually specifies where the loop starts. So what we need to do now is the retrieval command needs to be indented. And I'm gonna press the backspace and you can see now this c.retrieve command is indented four spaces to the right, so I need to move this way, uh, in order for it to be considered part of the loop. If I didn't do that, if I have it to the left, this retrieve command is only run once, and therefore I would actually get an error because I would need to have a statement here like print year. So the, the year here would be printed out each time in the loop, but the retrieve command would only be operated once. So let's indent again four spaces to the right, so this becomes part of the loop. Great. Now there are two more steps that we need to make. Now the first is quite obvious. When we actually specify the year here, we need to change it for the variable which we've called year. Now you'll notice that when we pass the arguments to the retrieve function, it's actually passed as a dictionary and each member of that dictionary, the argument is passed as a string or a list of strings. 
Okay, so if we were to just type in the variable year here, we'd actually get an error because year from the range function takes an integer value, it's a number, it's not a string. So therefore we need to convert it to a string by using the string function which is str and then curly brackets. So this would actually pass us a string of the year in turn each time this loop is operated. So that's great. We would actually now get the data for each of the years in the loop, but there's still a problem. Now I wonder if any of you can spot what the problem might be. So you can pause the video for a second just to consider it. Okay, so for those of you that spotted it, well done. You're well on your way to being Python masters. And if you didn't spot it, it doesn't matter. If we scroll down to the bottom here, we have download.nc as the output file. So this means in the first loop, we would get the 1979 data and put it into download.nc. In the second iteration of this loop for 1980, it would get the data, but it would store it in the same file name and it doesn't append it, it would just simply overwrite it. So at the end of the program, we'd end up with just the data for 2020. So what we need to do is need to modify this so that each time the loop runs, we have a different file name. And it's easy to forget this step. It's happened to me many times. So we will change this. Download is anyway a bit of a boring name, isn't it? So we will change this to era5 underscore. Now I'm going to type here. Now this is inside the string, so it will simply have the letters Y-E-A-R in the file name. And now I want to concatenate strings together. So to this string, I'm going to add another string which actually contains the value of the year. Now remember again, the year is a number, so we still need to use the string function to turn year from a number into a string, otherwise we'd get an error. And then I'm going to add on the last piece of the string, which is .nc. So each time now we have a different file name with the year number inside. So I'm going to save this and just to emphasize then, to remember the three things we needed to change. We had the year inside the loop. We needed to indent the retrieve command. The variable of the loop, we needed to basically change from a number to a string. And then we needed to change the file name, okay? So I'm gonna save this and I'm gonna go back now to my desktop over here, and we can then try to run this script. So off it goes. Oops, and I've tried to use Python 2, which doesn't work. Let's try again with Python 3, and we can see the command is now off and it is queuing in the system. So while that's retrieving the data, I want to go back to the Emacs. Uh, window and just show you one or two more things. We've looped over one of these variables, but there's no reason why you can't loop over one of the others. So for example, you might actually want to separate the data into both years and months. So we could also set up another loop and have nested loops by doing the same thing, four mun in range and then one to 12 or one to 13, I should say. But we also have another possibility. We could very easily cut and paste this list of strings and actually just iterate over that list. It's already predefined. So we could just say for man in, and then I'm going to paste that list. We need the colon, don't forget the colon. So now of course we need to indent once more. Okay, so that the year loop is part of the month loop and the retrieve is part of both of these nested loops. So mun will take in turn each of the string values inside this list and then we would loop over years. And of course, we then need to add mun to the options. So we have mun. Now you notice I don't need to convert it to a string because it already has a string value inside this list. And we also need not to forget to add this to the file name in this way. So we put underscore mun and then we add the month here. Now you could do this to any of these variables. Obviously, 
You don't want to make the retrieval too small because you're constantly going to the server and queuing in the server. So uh, use the web interface to get an idea of roughly the size of retrieval, which is you know close to the maximum, but uh, not too small. You might, however, want to consider looping over the variables to have a separate variable in a separate file. So again, you would just take this list of strings for the variable names and say for var in this list. So that way I've shown you how to do two different methodologies for looping over the data. So we saw how it was very easy and simple to use a loop within the Python script in the CDS API to set up a retrieval for very large amounts of data, much larger than you can get using the web interface. So really taking advantage of the strengths of the API. Go away a couple of hours, maybe you need a day, depends on the size, and you will have a whole list of files in your directory. In the case that we show today, each file being the data set for one particular year. So I hope you found that useful and interesting, and I look forward to seeing you again on Climate Unboxed.